Is the Kolini Magistrates Court wrong to grant bail to two men accused of killing Matlomola Mosweu? Do we have two judicial systems, one for blacks and another for whites? To what extent do attacks on journalists impact media freedom? What will it take to bring stability back to Kolini? What time is it? It's question time. Hello and welcome to the show. Your host is Bongi Kuala in from Port Zedi today. Chaos broke out in Kolini in the northwest yesterday after two white men accused of killing 16-year-old Matlomla Mosweu were granted bail. The local community took to the streets after Peter Dorevard and Philip Skirte were granted 5,000 rand bail each. Handing down his bail application judgment, Magistrate Mahaula Foso said the pair did not have any criminal records, adding that the court could not be held to ransom. A house belonging to a local farmer was set alight. Meanwhile, the South African National Editors Forum, SANEF, says journalists should be allowed to do their work without fear or favor. This after journalists were attacked in Colini and El Dorado Park. In the latest developments, Northwest MEC for Safety in Paul Motlabane says they would appeal the decision of the Colony Magistrate Court, which granted bail to the two men. But which criteria are used to grant or deny bail? We are live, uh, therefore, to uh, our reporter there. But first, let's give us uh, your number, uh, or our number, in fact, 0891104210. That's the number to call because we're live today. 089114. Um, let me get that number straight. 0891104210. One zero. That's the number. Otherwise, you can tweet us our Twitter handle at question time 24. My guest in the studio today, Molatelo Mahapa from Mahapa Attorneys. Molatelo, good to be having you in studio. Same here. And uh, Katie Katapodis, uh, who is the deputy chairperson at the South African National Editors Forum. Good to have you as well. Thank you, Bongi. Lovely to be here. All right. Before we get to the discussion, let's cross to our reporter in the Northwest today, Olobekhen Khosilense, uh, who is there to tell us more about what is uh, going on right now. Olobekhen, what's the latest? Good to be chatting to you. Good evening, Bongi. Well, I can say that things keep changing here in Colini. So there is not a, a, you know, a steady situation that we can report on. Just before we cross live okay. to you, our journalists were chased away by protesting uh, community members in Kabulukhang, uh, in for, uh, location rather, here in Colini. They were, we, are, we were seeing flames going up and uh, upon inquiry, our, our team of SABC News members went there to find out what's happening and they were chased away. Uh, the police have also been firing a lot of rubber bullets here in Colini. Uh, you know, the, the community very upset today by uh, the address by MEC Mpomutabani, you know, when he tried to calm them down, trying to tell them to accept the situation and accept that judgment has been uh, given in the bailing, uh, in the bail application of the two accused men uh, uh, that are accused of uh, murdering Matlomula Musweu. So for now, the situation is calm, but it is tense. Um, just a few moments ago, the R-543 linking Colin and Lichtenberg was closed for traffic, but now we see that cars are moving again. So every now and then, things keep changing. Bongi? All right, so Lobokhan, you, you are saying that uh, the, the, the crowds, the community was not happy with the MEC. So is, is that perhaps why he then had to change and say, government is going to appeal this decision by the magistrate's court. No, in fact, he had already said that to the people. So why so were they angry they're, they're with just him? still unsatisfied. They want to see... They were angry with him because he was not saying that... Uh, um, the people will be will return back to police custody. He, they, he, he was not saying what they were wanting to hear. Although he was explaining to them that uh, uh, you know it's not that easy. 
if court processes have taken place, but he assured them of the government's commitment to help the family appeal this uh, judgment bail. But uh, regardless of what he was saying, regardless of what community, what community leaders were saying, they were not interested. They were not taking any of the things. They even got more angry when uh, MEC Mutabani appealed to them to allow school children to go back to school tomorrow, seeing as how we are approaching the June examination phase and that uh, school children have al already lost a lot of school time and they need to catch up on their studies. They, they, were, they were having none of that, Bongit, saying that no, until such time that uh, uh, Peter Joranvat and Philip Skitter go back to police custody, we will remain adamant that the children will not go to school, businesses will not function, and definitely Colini will stay as it is at the moment. All right. Thank you very much uh, to our reporter there, Lobekhan Khosilhentswe. All right. Let me come to you from a legal point of view, uh, Moladelo Mahapa from Mahapa Attorneys. Is it as easy as all that, that the community is going to say they must go back to, uh, to custody and, and it happens? If it doesn't happen, they will continue uh, with the rampage? Thank you for the question. Uh, maybe for starters, we need to explain in the first place what bail is all about. Yes. Bail is a process where the person that is, has been apprehended make a commitment to the state to say when I'm out of jail at that particular point in time as and when you want me to come and appear in court I will definitely avail myself I think that's where the starting point is and so it's, it's an agreement or a contract between the state and the accused person and anybody in the country obviously has a right to bail However, there are requirements that a magistrate would look into when granting or denying bail. So in this circumstance, I wouldn't in the first place would have granted bail because of the circumstances of the, the situation. I wouldn't have all facts before me in relation to what transpired in court or what the magistrate had before him for him to conclude and come when to When you say you wouldn't team. have granted bail, what do you mean? Are, are you saying because of the mood in the society outside the courtroom, perhaps you wanted to consider that, or you, co you would consider facts as they are in front of you to say, for instance, number one, no criminal record here. Number two, are they flight risk? No, perhaps. That's what the, 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 the magistrate considered. Yes, but remember that when you consider bail, it's not only about the rights of the people that have been apprehended or the accused persons or the suspects. Um, the interest of justice as well is looked into and it's more of that than your rights as, as an accused person. For instance, the magistrate would look at the, you know, uh, the offence that, that is allegedly uh, before him and secondly, if the, the, the accused persons by, by being released, they wouldn't cause harm to anyone, including witnesses, because there's a possibility that given the, the characters of those particular people, if they are aggressive in nature, you are risking the witnesses or you are risking other people. It might be, in this case, the victim, unfortunately, has passed. In, in your view, has the magistrate not considered all those uh, probabilities before granting bail. Surely he went through thoroughly, went through some of those issues and uh, he was convinced in his mind that uh, perhaps it's the right decision. And that's why I'm saying obviously he has a right to make a decision. But from where I'm sitting and the, the way the situation is, I for one I wouldn't have granted that bail even at that amount of money. All right. Let me let me turn my attention to you, Katie, here, because it's important to uh, look at how the media has performed in, in covering this particular issue. But also I want to bring in the issue in El Dorado Park. I want to bring also the, the developments in Vuani, for instance, in the last couple of days where we've seen journalists being attacked. Mm -hmm. How have journalists performed, in your view, as SANEF, as the, as the body that takes in, you know, looks after the interests of, uh, of journalists 
in the, in the last in the three incidents that I'm uh, uh, that I'm highlighting. Well, Bongi, I certainly think it's been a bad period for journalists who are covering these stories and in these conflict situations. So we've got the situation in Kalini. We just heard your reporter now as well saying journalists are being asked to leave the area. Residents are not letting uh, uh, reporters go into the area. We've got Kalini. We've got Vawani. We've got El Dorado Park. We've got Ennerdale. It seems to be that angry community members are turning their attentions on journalists on, on uh, two journalists on the ground who are just simply there to do their work and and for me in terms of of that i would say as san if we strongly condemn that it's shocking did you see the footage by the way of the journalist in kalini who was manhandled and physically attacked by uh, one of the residents there because he didn't like that the journalists were, were wanting to ask him questions that is unacceptable in any scenario and we can never ever condone that and and the the, the, the patterns in in southern africa in particular you know, where journalists are harassed for doing their work, but uh, most of the time it's when they're speaking truth to, mm. to power. This time around, it's the communities that are angry with the journalists. What do you read into that? Well, first and foremost, Bongi, journalism is not a crime, and we can never criminalize, in inverted commas, the jobs and the work that the reporters on the scene do. Why do I think that some community members have turned their attention on journalists? In the case of that farmer in Kalini yesterday, I think he was just highly agitated. He clearly was in distress. His home was being uh, uh, set alight or potentially set alight, but it still doesn't give him the right to, to physically attack a journalist like that. Uh, did he not want his picture taken? Unfortunately, he's part of a news story now. Unfortunately, he becomes a newsmaker and a person of interest. In terms of other members of communities and why they turn their attention on journalists, often we've seen they don't like journalists who are taking pictures of them as there is looting or as there is some kind of criminality happening. They want to prevent their pictures from being publicized and being broadcast. But whatever the scenario is, I believe that an environment needs to be created where journalists can go into an area and work freely and work fairly. And as Sanif, we call on communities to say allow reporters to do that allow reporters to come in and to report obviously we also have a responsibility to report fairly and to report accurately and for me that's very important to SANEF to say we too have a huge responsibility and our newsrooms and our journalists do but really Journalism is not a crime, and the media needs to be able to report freely. All right. This is a uh, question time coming to you live uh, this uh, today. Let's go to Vusi. Vusi is in Valcom, uh, I think. Vusi, you're in Valcom. Hello. Hello. How are you? Doing? I'm fine, Vusi. Go ahead. What's, uh, what's your issue? I'm fine. Look, um, I think I listened to the, the judgment of the magistrate for so, as it is. The magistrate considered all the factors that are supposed to be looked at before uh, judgment can be granted. Right. He looks at the likelihood, for instance, uh, what are the interests of the society, uh, the interests of the justice, likelihood as to whether the accused persons commit crime, etc., etc. But what have yet he said? Um, the state case is not good at all. The state case was very weak. There was no actually an evidence that connects uh, both applicants with uh, the case that uh, the crime that was committed. People, we should not bother ourselves. Look at what is the public outcry. In as much as people's rights are being respected, but that does not uh, let the court succumb to the public outcry. But Vusi, Don't forget Vusi, to let me ask you a question. Vusi, Vusi, let me ask that you a question. That judgment was so meticulous. Okay. It was All right. a good judgment. All right, Vusi, let me, let me ask you a quick question, please. To say okay, Vusi is not going to listen to me. All right, Vusi, we're going to have to let you go. Thank you very much. But uh, Vusi is raising a very important point that... Uh, uh, we must not allow the situation that is permeating the area, yes. the society, uh, dictate to the courts what decisions to take. Does he have a point there? Indeed, he has a point. Um, obviously, the, the, the courts are very independent. And uh, as I said, I wouldn't have all facts before me right. like the magistrate has. And indeed, he's raising a good question uh, or a good point to say, if the prosecution as well didn't put its case the way it's supposed to, I mean, there's nothing much that you can do as a magistrate because you evaluate the, the, the obviously the, the evidence that is before you, what has been 
put by the prosecution and the defense as well. Right. Uh, before we go to Wiseman on the line, uh, Katie, let me, let me bring you in here. I mean, if you look at the utterances by, by the leadership, I mean, I think the, 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 the Premier in, in the Northwest, uh, Supra Mahamapilo, has been really dealing with this situation in, in the right way, so to speak. But if he says Colini Tin died in the hands of Afrikaners, uh, suggesting that, uh, you know, he, he was killed for racial reasons, is it, is it correct to put it like that? at a time like this when, when the whole colony is burning? Mm. You know, I think race dynamics play an important part of who we are in South Africa at the moment. And we cannot ignore it. We cannot ignore the facts before us. Uh, so was he right to speak in, in racial terms? I think the reality of the situation is that this has now become a story about race. It is a story about a black teenager, a 16-year-old youth who died allegedly, according to witnesses, at the hands of two white but, people but in the area. But when did it move from being initially, which is what we are not looking at right now, uh, initially and allegedly a criminal case where this farmer has the sunflower uh, uh, you know, farm and his sunflower gets stolen all the time. He puts money, preparing, he, he expects certain returns and he doesn't get those returns because sunflower is stolen. We're not, we're not talking about that. I've not seen any report that puts uh, em emphasis on that. Because I don't think you can divorce the two. I don't think it's a matter of just a criminal case on the one side mm -hmm. and race issues on the other. I think these are so blended because this is the narrative of South Africa at the moment and these are the realities that we are living in. This is the country at the moment. We also see stories, investigative pieces, reporters who've gone into Kalini and described the most horrendous scenarios. Scenarios where you would think you were back in 1982 in mm -hmm. apartheid South Africa and that becomes a part of the story. Unfortunately, it's not either or. You can't separate them, Bongi. All right, let's go back to the lines. Wiseman, you're in PE. Hello, Wisey. Good evening, Bongi, and good evening to your guest, my oh, friend. Yes, sir. Uh, honestly, Bongi, I think there is a justice system for white people and a justice system for black people and a justice system for poor and the rich people. A arrested black student protester will go to court handcuffed and receive no bail. But a white man who kill an innocent child will go to court uncuffed and receive a lousy bail of 5,000 rand. Let me tell you a story. A, a, a former uh, president of South Africa, F.W. de Klerk, uh, his ex-wife was killed by a security, uh, I think the guy was her security guard, but the evidence was the, the only evidence found was the, her cell phone, uh, the cell phone of the deceased was found with the security guard, but that guy was sentenced to life in prison. Let me tell you a fact now. If that guy well, he killed a, a black woman, there was no going to be a such sentence. Or if that guy was a white man, there was no going to be a such sentence. Let me tell you a fact now. If Oscar Pistorius, Pistorius was a black man and killed Rivers Tien Camp, he was going to face a life sentence. That's how the justice system uh, uh, works in South Africa. Okay, that Wiseman. is a brutally and honest truth. Thank okay. you, Bongi. We got you. Thank you very much, Wiseman. Do we have two justice systems in South Africa? One <laughs> that is for the white folk and one for the black folk. You, you work in courts. You, you should... You should uh, you I know, know that we have one justice system. Yeah. The unfortunate part is... But is it interpreted... In black and white? It, it becomes, you know, it gets to that point because when different cases are actually compared and, you know, they, some don't even make sense, as the, the caller has just said. Um, hence, when we started, I said, if I were the magistrate, I wouldn't even have granted, you know, bail at that amount of money given the situation that we have. Hmm. So how do, how do we move then beyond that? Bail has been granted, and uh, there is an uproar from, from political leaders, from government, from the community also. Nobody is happy. Well, yes. except, I guess, for the two who have been released right now. So how do we move beyond that? Because we can't just leave the country and, and, and call any burning. Yes. Um, as I've heard that an appeal will be brought, I hope it will be brought. If not, remember that the bail application phase, it's not a trial. Um, it's not where you'll get all the evidence or, you know, have to hear in terms of what really transpired. I would say let's afford 
the the system to take place at this, as it's supposed to to take place because remember the bail application phase it's not there to actually punish anyone yeah however it is there just to say we confirm that as we want you to come and appear you will come and appear in court so in your view as this appeal is being made do you think it needs to be revoked the the bail that has been granted already it needs to be relooked at Yes, if, if, if appeal is, is actually granted, then yes. Uh, for me, I would say the bail application be, uh, or the order be, be, be revoked. Okay, let's go to Zeras now, and uh, Sarah Pello is, uh, is on the line. Good to be chatting to you, Sarah Pello. Hello. Thanks. Uh, um, I would like to know, uh, to ask, uh, would it be possible for the court to reverse their decision looking at the situation right now, especially for, for the children, as uh, Ole Bukheng has just alluded, that uh, it is time for examination or media examination? Okay, good question. Thank you very much. I guess uh, this goes to you, uh, Muletelo, quickly. Do, do you think uh, it, 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 it's, it's doable? But remember, as we indicated, that the, the, the courts will not make decisions because, you know, we have this uproar and they will have to consider all the facts. Okay. And as I said, um, it has been indicated that obviously from the prosecution side, probably the case was not, you know, put as it was supposed to. So even if it goes to for appeal, all those factors will be looked at if then it transpires that, you know, all the evidence in relation to the bail application required was put forth by the prosecution, then that, that could be reversed. Right, Katie, so how do we protect our journalists? How do we protect our journalists? First and foremost, it's safety. So we, we like to say to our, our newsroom, safety first, that's the most important thing. Secondly, we'd like to see police um, actually act when they see journalists are coming under fire. I think it's very important that the police intervene and they, and they try as far as possible to protect uh, reporters. We also call on communities to say, just allow journalists to do their jobs actually because that's the most important thing. And, and any platforms for journalists to you know, put their case if they feel they're not safe? Should they just leave and leave the story alone? and put their safety first? You know, obviously this is something that reporters need to talk to the editors about. I personally, speaking as an editor, uh, that's, my, that's my philosophy. Your safety comes first. Don't worry so much about the story. So they need to speak to their editors. And then they need to raise these things with Sanif. If something happens, we've had three days in a row now of incidents with journalists. If something happens, Sanif needs to know about this. We're in constant communication with the police. The police minister issued a statement yesterday saying he condemns it. There's a meeting as we speak, by the way with the police minister and some editors around this and other issues. So it's very, very important that we keep talking about these things. And, and briefly, is it, is it becoming dangerous to be a journalist in South Africa? It is. It's a very dangerous time. These are volatile times, and particularly when we look at actual protests which erupt like this. It's never easy, and, um, you know, it's par for the course, though. You know, that's what journalism is, and this, to a large degree, is what gets our adrenaline flowing. Okay. Um, so it is very much what we do as, as reporters in South Thank Africa. Thank you very much, Katie Katapodi, Deputy Chairperson of the South African National Editors Forum, SANEF, and uh, to you as well, uh, Mulatelo Mahapa from uh, Mahapa Attorneys. Thank you very much. And that was uh, question time for today. A big thank you to my guest and uh, for you at home, uh, to you at home rather, for watching and of course uh, coming through. My name is Bongi Kuala. I was sitting in for Mpote for tonight. And good night.